Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in today and welcome to Magnolias for Small Gardens. Um, obviously, I have more than magnolias with me uh, at the moment and that's because I'm also going to talk about some companion plantings to go along with magnolias in the landscape. Um, and, and there's a reason why. Um, magnolias don't like to be alone, um, which, you know, is kind of an interesting fact about a plant. Uh, but I read it and I witnessed it kind of in real garden settings and magnolias uh, tend to benefit from uh, being planted with other shrubs and even under plantings. So it may be a combination of kind of living mulch as well as some windbreaks that um, magnolias get benefit from. There are so many different types of magnolias, both different species within the genus and then hybrids and cultivars and varieties within all of the different species of magnolias. In fact, there are, they are an ancient tree species or tree genus and they actually have uh, in the fossil record one of the longest uh, proven existences that we know as far as flowering plants go. And they developed their flowers before insects decided to make wings. And so their flowers ha happen to be beetle pollinated even to this day. Uh, so they don't get visited by a lot of bees or pollinators. The flowers themselves are not full of nectar, which we would um, normally associate with the great big flower that they, you know, that they are. But rather the flowers have a high concentration of pollen and pollen is a protein source for beetles and pollinators and um, even hummingbirds and butterflies. Now, uh, sometimes people hear pollen and they start thinking, uh-oh, is this gonna trip up my allergies? Possibly people are allergic to magnolias, but I have never heard anyone say, I'm highly allergic to magnolia trees. Um, so the pollen doesn't seem to be a high irritant. <clears throat> and also the time of year that magnolias tend to be in their um, biggest bloom is really early in the season and possibly before a lot of us are out or windows are open and that kind of thing, so in March. Now, the, um, that wide variety and multitude of types of magnolias means that there are magnolias that grow to heights of 40, 50 feet or even more in a big magnificent canopy of a tree, but then there are um, the realities that most of us are facing these days, which is that our gardens are getting smaller and smaller as urban uh, lots become uh, tighter spaced and we have less opportunity to grow large trees in um, our urban settings. By the way, um, as I always kind of forget to mention, there is a handout that's a companion to this class. It is um, attached just below the description of this video. So right at the top there where it says Magnolias for Small Gardens. If you're having problems uh, finding or getting the handout, please put a comment in the comment section that you need access to the handout and we'll make sure to directly link it to you. The handout um, does have some really great pictures of these because sadly um, they're not quite yet in bloom. So we are uh, here we're in mid-February and the typical early flowering magnolias in the Portland metro area were, uh, will begin blooming sometime in March, most likely. So I have here a range of uh, sizes and as you'll see on the blog, uh, there's most of the magnolias that we've highlighted in this class and in the articles really stay under 20 to 25 feet tall. And then there are a few at the end of the list that are highlighted that are slightly larger than that on into that 30 and even on the 30, 40 foot range, which may not be appropriate for the smallest of urban settings or urban gardens. But I did want to include them as um, their glorious cultivars that uh, are among some of my favorites as well. So you'll see that as we go along. Now, where do magnolias like to grow and kind of just what are their um, likes and dislikes? Magnolias are pretty easy going as far as the type of soil that they like. They do prefer to grow in slightly acidic 
soil conditions, which is why the pH in our native soil here in the Pacific Northwest seems to be just right for them. Um, no need to make pH adjustments. Also, they like to be in rich but well-draining soil, which means, again, if we are in the Pacific Northwest and we're dealing with a lot of poor draining clay soil, it's a good idea to try to amend with some organic matter that'll help to open up the drainage and assist with um, excessive wet periods where potentially the plant sits in too wet of soil and the roots start to have uh, rotting issues. So do make sure it's in well-drained soil. Full sun is great, but a hot, reflective, intense afternoon sun can uh, kind of burn up the little flowers and create a leaf scorch as well. So many varieties actually benefit from light dappled shade or at least some afternoon shade to just preserve um, better looking leaves and flowers. They are um, not exactly a drought tolerant tree, but they, like I mentioned, are tolerant of a wide range of soils and conditions. The <clears throat> I'm going to get into kind of talking about their blooms and their bloom time, which is really interesting. But one of the features of their bloom cycle is that in order for a magnolia to flower for us in really like the green light of spring, you know, the very, 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 very beginning of spring, for them to bloom so early in March, the flower buds that they bloom on were formed the previous year. So usually a magnolia is working on its brand new flower buds for the future in late summer, July, August, September. And those tend to be some of our driest, hottest months here in the Portland metro area. So an occasional, maybe every three weeks, a supplemental watering even for your established magnolias can help them have a better set of flowers, larger blooms, and maybe even more flowers than um, if you left that in an unirrigated or did not give supplemental water to the tree. Now, um, in addition, uh, I have mostly deciduous magnolias here, but I do also have one of several varieties of evergreen magnolias. So here I've got little gem which um, again, I'm gonna get into in more detail when we start talking about the different cultivars. But Little Gem Magnolia is one of our evergreen varieties, which means that these large waxy green leaves stay on through the winter, which can occasionally make them more vulnerable to ice or snowy conditions, which will weigh these branches down in heavy snow or ice coating the branches way and kind of you know flop down the branches which can cause splitting or winter damage so it is a good idea in ice storms to you know put your boots on be very careful but go out and knock off the ice or snow from your magnolias so that the branches don't just you know stay weighted down and end up kind of being disformed or even possibly damaged by snow likewise late season ice events or extreme frosts that come late in winter or early spring can also damage that tender developing flower bud that's sitting out there at the edges of the, the branch tips. So they are vulnerable to extreme weather conditions which can cause some browning or damage on a few of the flowers as they try to open in spring. But a late season frost or an unfortunate weather event in almost all instances is only going to impact the current season's flowers and the plants will recover and be able to just rebloom on, on sink, you know, and normally the following year. So it's only a setback, not a critical uh, blow to the plant. Now, um, they're also relatively deer resistant trees. Now I say relatively deer resistant because come on, if you've got deer and elk and uh, major uh, browsing pressure from wildlife, they're, they're gonna eat whatever they want. They're gonna rub on or step on plants that they don't eat. So deer resistance um, can you know really come with a lot of like caveats or um, 
modifiers, if you know what I mean, but uh, they aren't the favorite to be just munched on by deers in general. Not like roses that they will, you know, create a path into your garden to go and eat roses. The habit, the growth habit of a lot of our magnolias are kind of low and bushy. In fact, when we're talking about some of these, uh, such as Anne here, sorry, I have so many other fun plants that they may not even be able to really see the magnolias, but Anne has a really beautiful pale on the inside, kind of a pale purple, and then a deeper purple outer petal. And Anne's got small flower buds that are just still getting ready to ripen. You can see that this is a shrubby looking tree. It has a low, barely even has a trunk, looks more like a bush than a tree. It has a low branch structure. It has a wide, uh, extensive branching habit. And it's literally as wide as it is tall, if not even a little bit wider than tall. So Anne's got an ultimate height of about 10 feet tall and eight to 10 feet wide. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> so it's going to end up as just a ball, a very rounded ball shaped plant that really is like a large shrub or a small tree, eight to 10 feet. I mean, we're right in that. Is it a tree, is it a shrub? So of course, without a real defined trunk and canopy habit, it starts to even further blur the lines um, between whether or not this would be considered a tree or a shrub. Now you can, to a certain extent, over time, raise the canopy on some of these magnolias to create enough space to plant underneath them. However, magnolias in general tend to have a fairly shallow root system and their shallow root system doesn't like to be regularly disturbed or cultivated underneath. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the class, magnolias don't like to grow alone, but they don't want you to be constantly in there pawing around in their soil that's right around the roots. So putting in some permanent underplantings that are low growing and easy care are the ideal uh, companion plants to grow underneath of magnolias. And considering a few other things, <coughs> including that a deciduous magnolia will drop its leaves, we need to be able to rake those leaves up and I'll get into that again in a minute, and that they bloom so early, it's either ideal to give uh, the underplanting uh, the consideration of something that may come up in spring, such as a bulb, but be completely gone by fall, so that when the leaves fall on the ground, their bare ground is easy to rake up, or put underplanting such as hostas or herbaceous perennials underneath them, so that again, uh, they the plants underneath are dormant, so that it's easy for you to remove and rake the leaves. The um, leaves on magnolias are even on deciduous ones. There's a few still trapped in the plant. <coughs> Excuse me. We have um, various forms of decomposed and decomposing leaves that I'll kind of have Becky sort of zoom in on here, maybe on the table. But the thing is that the leaves are relatively large. They're paddle sized or kind of, you know, donkey ear shaped. And they've got like a waxy surface to them. Even more waxy, of course, than deciduous magnolia leaves is the evergreen magnolia leaf, which is so waxy that it has a shine to the surface. And that waxy, shiny surface, this is a young leaf, so it doesn't really have the brown fuzzy back, but is often backed by a um, kind of soft fuzzy brown on the undersides and you can see it more on a few of these more mature leaves but that waxy surface and magnolia leaves in general are really really durable which is a, another way of saying they don't decompose very quickly and they hang around a lot longer than many other of our fall leaves 
uh, have long since decomposed and blown away or turned to dust. And we have a little bit of skeletalization on this leaf, but still quite a bit of this leaf is remaining. And it may take up to a year for the foliage on an evergreen magnolia to decompose, which means that you're gonna wanna remove it from the landscape once it falls. Now, an evergreen magnolia doesn't drop everything in the fall like our deciduous ones do, but just like as I brush my hair every morning or whatever, maybe every morning, the hair, you know, there's hair in the hairbrush, but I'm still growing new hair. So living cells, skin cells, hair, leaf cells, they only last so long on plants. Even an evergreen is going to occasionally retire some of the oldest foliage and let it fall to the ground. So they don't do it in the fall necessarily, but kind of a random dropping of foliage all year round on a uh, evergreen magnolia. Okay, how the flowers, oh, we talked a little bit about when the flowers form using Anne as an example on habit, that low kind of bushy habit. Royal Star, another really good example of that low branching bushy habit. In fact, Royal Star, we even see, get it out here a little bit more. We have a main trunk and kind of form that could kind of be sheared up a little bit, or not sheared, pruned up as the tree grows to be a little bit more trunk and tree canopy, but it's still gonna have a wide rounded uh, habit. But then we've, not, we've got a new shoot that's coming kind of low off of the main trunk that ultimately will make another kind of low branch uh, on this that we could either choose to prune off or allow to create that lower structure and of course, some of the dead foliage can just, or dead growth um, can just be removed. But when we prune, when do we prune on these magnolias? I know a lot of people, again, with several weeks of sunny weather and the, um, the air just starts feeling more and more like spring. I may have lost count, but I believe we are 38 days until the first day of spring today. But the air has changed and we can feel it. And a lot of folks have been out in their gardens this last couple of weeks doing uh, some cleanup that maybe they didn't do in the fall, getting ready for some exciting projects this spring. And thinking about doing pruning is often one of the things that uh, we know to do this time of year. There are lots of great things to prune this time of year, including your roses, your fruit trees, your blueberries, any of the summer blooming plants that you may have. Uh, however, this is not the time of year to prune anything that is expected to bloom in the spring or may be budded at this point and waiting to open its flowers very, very soon. So we have an uh, example, of course, here is Viburnum tinus. This is spring bouquet. We see the beautiful burgundy or kind of maroon flower buds that are sitting on the tops of this plant. And they will, within uh, the next few weeks, begin to open into a white cluster of flowers on here. So if we came across uh, this and just pruned it off, we would take all the flowers off for spring. The same goes for your rhododendrons that you have out in your gardens right now, rhododendrons and azaleas, which make wonderful companions for magnolia plantings. They are evergreen. They are uh, in that same um, soil, acidic, slightly acidic, acidic soil conditions they prefer. <coughs> they tend to um, like that same filtered sun exposure, so a little sun and a little shade that the Magnolia is going to provide them in the summertime with the foliage. But you'll see if your rhododendrons uh, take a look at them today and you'll see big fat buds probably up at the tops and at the outer edges of the, of the rhododendrons as they are preparing to bloom as well. So we wouldn't do any pruning on the rhododendron until after they finish blooming later this season. Pieris or Andromeda, another evergreen 
shrub that we grow often in the same environments or conditions as rhododendrons and azaleas. This is Pieris japonica. This is a dwarf low growing variety called cavatine. Cavatine gets two to three feet tall and a mounding habit, so three to four feet wide. It's evergreen. Little buds were formed in uh, late, fall, late summer, fall, and then these little buds will open into white bell-shaped flowers that are lightly fragrant, again, in early spring. Hummingbirds, pollinators, um, even honeybees, they all love the flowers on uh, the Andromeda or Pyrrhus. This dwarf form is lovely, but there are also taller varieties of Pyrrhus japonica, um, anywhere from three to four feet, as I mentioned, on up to five, six, and six to eight feet. So different sizes if you're looking for that kind of background planting instead. Speaking of another <clears throat> background plant that does great in, again, magnolia situations, our native Oregon grape. This is Mahonia aquifolium. It's another one that I think has great foliage color and interest. It is just about to burst with bright yellow flowers that are also favored by hummingbirds and pollinators. So in spite of the fact, of course, that your magnolia may not have much to offer pollinators, you can surround the magnolia planting with plants that do provide habitat and kind of compensate or at least make up for the fact that you've put in a great big tree that, um, you know, hummingbirds and bees don't have anything to do with. But the Oregon grape is, um, again, one of those just fantastic native plants that's suited to so many different conditions, being its native uh, habitat is here. And the standard aquifolium is the taller growing of the um, genus, but there are lower, more ground cover type plants, um, type species within the genus as well. So um, if you like that look and you want to go native underneath your magnolias, by all means, um, consider the different forms of, I'm going to call it Mahonia, but it's been reclassified as a Berberis. Um, if you're not into Latin names, you don't care about what I just said. But if you are, um, we know that things have changed. It's just really changes hard. Um, so uh, there, I have, there, I said it. Now, <clears throat> Rhododendrons, Pieris, Mahoney, Berberis. I've got some really fun um, ornamental grasses that are also great. This is just a Carex called Ever, no, Feather Falls. Carex is a nice evergreen that just is soft and kind of easygoing, a little clumping or mounding grass. We have a uh, low spreading camellia, which is another great example of a plant that is in the same plant community as rhododendrons and azaleas, camellias, mahonia. It likes that slightly acidic soil, filtered or partial sun. This is a variety called Showa no Saki, which is a funny name, I know, but it means something to other people. It has a double hot pink flower, and this is a low spreading variety as well. It's three to four, oh, four to five feet tall, and then up to eight feet wide. So you can just imagine that nice kind of uh, low spreading canopy giving a beautiful evergreen and then uh, late fall and into kind of early winter bloom when really not much is going on in um, probably the rest of that garden setting. Showa no Saki um, definitely is a <clears throat> dramatic addition to the garden. Now, on to the, com the, the magnolias that I have. Sorry, not the camellias. The magnolias that I have. <clears throat> the handout is um, detailed on height of all these varieties. But height and spread can um, be important because not all of them have that fully rounded habit. So as I mentioned, Anne, uh, Royal Star tend to be... Uh, almost as round as they are tall, eight to ten, for example, eight feet, eight to ten feet wide, ten feet tall. There are varieties that tend to be um, more narrow and upright. So one of the more narrow and upright varieties that is also on the uh, it's newer is Genie, and Genie is just this 
on the verge of black color. So one of the darkest of the magnolias. And this is a kind of goblet or tulip style flower. You can see uh, all of these fuzzy, they look like pussy willows. This is not a pussy willow. That's a magnolia flower bud. They're fuzzy and uh, plumping as we speak. Genie here is a uh, scented, scented flower that blooms on bare branches, which also makes them more dramatic. So large blooms on bare branches with no leaves to interfere. And Genie's going to get up to about 10 to 13 feet tall, but only five to six feet wide. So really nice pyramidal, perfect for an average garden. Uh, this is already up on the table that I'm speaking on, so it's got some height to it. But if I stand and raise my hand as high as I can, I reach to seven and a half feet to the tips of my fingers. So if we're looking at a tree that can get 10 to 13 feet, it's not even twice my reach would be the mature height of that tree. So really quite, and then five to six feet wide. Again, my wingspan is about five and a half feet wide. So our tree is about this wide by twice my reach, which is an easy fit into almost any garden. And again, the blooms that come out on this look like, uh, people often call magnolias tulip trees. Now, Anyone who's really a tree or plant person is going to be like, there's already a tree called a tulip tree that's not actually a magnolia. So magnolias, tulip trees, not all of the flowers even look like tulip flowers. So royal star looks sort of like a little starburst instead. I understand calling genie, for example, a tulip tree. And there is a variety that we are going to talk about that's called black tulip, which does not help my case of not calling it a tulip tree, but they don't all look like tulip flowers and royal star is more of a, a shooting star bloom. But many people do call them tulip trees because of that look of the flower itself. Now, royal star, as I mentioned, fragrant white flowers, another one that appears uh, blooms before the, the leaves come out in the spring. Centennial blush is um, another very similar flower type to the royal star. So that same starburst, but rather than the pure white, it's a pale, pale pink when it blooms. And centennial blush, also fragrant, is very hardy, grows to 12 to 18 feet tall and 10 to 15 feet wide. So you, again, you can imagine it's more rounded in habit, but magnolias are tolerant of pruning. So as I said, don't go pruning them now. Doesn't mean you can't prune them at all. You prune magnolias just as they've finished blooming in the spring. So if they're blooming in March, you can be pruning them by early May, uh, and then you've not risked removing either this year's flowers or future flowers before they start to set in late summer. As I mentioned, black tulip, I mean, it, this tree is, when it's in bloom, it's enough to stop you in your tracks. The flower size is like, truly like a wine goblet in actual life size and, um, they are just stunning on the on the branch so we can see a flower bud that's forming on black tulip it's just it's fuzzy it's fuzzy like uh i don't know what it feels like it's it doesn't feel quite like a, maybe it's some sort of little animal it's fuzzy and soft these buds are still on the tight side so they've got a while to ripen but boy, like the last week or so that we've had of sunny, warm weather is enough to get them really going. Here right next to it is Genie. So you can see a slight difference in flower size between Genie and uh, Black Tulip. But as they begin to bloom, they're going to be just a little bit different in size with Black Tulip being a larger flower in general. 
I don't have Felix here today, but Felix is another really cool variety that um, is a new introduction from New Zealand. Not that it's a brand new tree, but it's just come into cultivation. Geographically, uh, worldwide, I think that Asia has the largest population of magnolias. China and Japan uh, combined probably have more than any other two countries in the world. However, um, there's magnolias in New Zealand. There uh, are evergreen magnolias, which we're going to talk about in here in a minute, also are amongst the like classic trees of the South. So the American South, in fact, um, for sure, evergreen magnolias are the state tree of Mississippi and probably at least one more of the Southern states. And I just don't happen to know. So. Uh, classic trees for us and classic and symbolic to a lot of different cultures all over the world. So also just really cool because, I mean, you could delve into like the meaning of magnolias in uh, Chinese garden and Japanese garden traditions and on some of their more kind of... Um, standard plant lists that are relied on through the garden palettes of Chinese gardens, for example. There are uh, specific magnolias that are planted near like temples or shrines. And um, I think again, part of that blooming on bare branches, so flowers just kind of coming out of stark winter on nothing is one of the things that just kind of makes them uh, almost just borderline like holy or uh, like a miracle or something like that. So not to go waxing poetic too much, but you know, I love to talk about plants. So um, anywhere and anyhow they fit into culture or religion or society or the global perspective, I think is fascinating and um, just brings us all kind of a little, a, a little bit closer together or maybe makes you feel like you can take a wor world tour and appreciate plants from different perspectives um, while never leaving your own garden. That in itself is the power of plants. Now, um, Elizabeth, butterflies, galaxy, more just awesome varieties that again, you'll see photos of the size and description. Elizabeth is one, I have Elizabeth, don't I? Pale yellow. And then Elizabeth, yes. Sorry to make you work, Becky, but Elizabeth is a gorgeous pale yellow magnolia. Now there's not a lot of yellow magnolias, but there, there are some. Butterflies, you'll see on your handout, is another of the, kind of probably one of the best, a golden yellow, whereas Elizabeth is more of a pale yellow. I don't, there is no, to my knowledge, there is no actual sugar magnolia. So if you are a, a Grateful Dead fan and that's the one you're looking for, you can make any one of these Sugar Magnolia uh, Blossoms Bloomin and put that in your Grateful Dead garden uh, for sure. Back to the Evergreen Magnolias for just a minute. Uh, there's some really great varieties that we carry that are perfect for small gardens. So as I mentioned, being that like traditional classic magnolia of the South, that's the tree that we think of like, there's a big swing underneath it. It's shading some like wraparound porch and everybody's sitting in the shade of this glorious ginormous tree, uh, taking a, you know, afternoon nap or whatever. That Southern magnolia is the standard sized 50 to 60 foot, maybe with an equal canopy or spread. Big, awesome trees. Bigger leaves even than our dwarf variety. So probably three times the size of this dwarf leaf would be the standard Southern Magnolia leaf. Little gem here is a dwarf form that also tends to be more columnar or slightly more uh, narrow and upright in its growth habit. We're looking at a tree that's going to end up at about 20 to 25 feet tall and 10 to 12 feet wide. So as opposed to, again, 10 by 10 on Anne, this is half as wide as it is tall at maturity. 
where uh, the, uh, the, a lot of these spring blooming deciduous magnolias flower on bare branches before the leaves emerge in the spring, the evergreen magnolia, of course, being that it's evergreen, never has bare branches. And its flowers tend to come out slightly later in spring. And they often bloom toward, like at the end of spring and on through the summer. There are, like I can see on this plant right now, there is a flower bud that is out for some confused reason. And it has become um, disfigured and damaged from weather. So that's what you get when you bloom out of season. Um, but this is, again, kind of giving you an idea of the flower bud size. I mean, that's almost the length of my index finger. And when this opens, this one will never open, so we've removed it. But when this opens, you're looking at a flower that's approximately like four to six inches in diameter and just this beautiful kind of ivory white bowl shape with a lovely scent when you put your uh, face towards it. So uh, it does waft a fragrance, but it's more potent if you're really just kind of getting up to it. Now, Little Gem has a few other dwarf um, companions that you can find at the garden centers. One of the newer versions that um, has recently come onto the market is Baby Grand. Baby Grand is like one of the smallest of all of the evergreen magnolias. It is, though, a rounded habit closer to these rounded, rounded canopy growers, like I mentioned. It's 8 to 10 feet tall and wide. Now, you can, over time, limb up the bottoms of the evergreen magnolias, but they do still tend to want to have low branching and a low branch habit. So that's another thing to just consider. Hard to mow underneath them, for example. So you don't necessarily want them to be in a lawn area, um, but great with a woodland garden setting or a perennial garden setting where you have under plantings um, to, to just accent them. The last evergreen is um, slightly larger than our dwarves, but one that shows the uh, the back side of the leaf is extremely uh, fuzzy and just an extra brown color. And that's a variety called Bracken's, Bl Bra Bracken's Brown Beauty. Uh, I was just going to rattle it off and then got all tied up. So Bracken's Brown Beauty is um, another evergreen, larger leaves, soft, fuzzy brown backs, but we're looking at a 30 to 50 foot tall tree and about a 15 to 30 foot spread. The deciduous magnolias have a range of cold hardiness. The range in general is like USDA zones four to eight, <clears throat> depending again on the variety. So some are less hardy than others, but four to eight is a pretty fair uh, big uh, kind of category. However, evergreen magnolias are less hardy because of the fact that their foliage is out all winter. So because of that, they're vulnerable to colder and more extreme temperatures. We typically like to consider their lower zone limit to be zone seven. So uh, I think that the tag says, so uh, I should have checked this. Uh, seven to nine is the zone that they give us on the little gems and evergreen magnolias in general. So uh, we, are, we are fortunate to be able to grow them here in the Portland metro area. A lot of our magnolias will actually, because they bloom super early, like March and sometimes April, they often will rebloom with light flushes of flowers in let's like let's say late summer and sometimes even fall uh, certain varieties are more reliable to rebloom um, specifically uh, Anne, which is a really well-known one for just a kind of a light reflowering come fall kind of freaks you out a little bit when you think wait a minute that's not supposed to bloom till spring but it's just doing it's it's just 
it puts out those buds and then some of those buds just jump the gun and, and flower. So it's not that they um, are doing it instead of their spring bloom. Just some of the flowers are eager and um, can't wait. <clears throat> if you are local and uh, want to see uh, a beautiful collection of mature magnolias, I mentioned this on the handout, but uh, one of my favorite public gardens to walk uh, and kind of just gain some peace and solitude at this time of year is called Elk Rock Gardens. And it's uh, here in Southwest Portland, not too far from our Lake Oswego location. I do give the website address on the handout so you can get the exact, I might even give the, the address I think on the handout. So. Um, do go and visit. It's specific. It's one of the largest collection of hardy magnolias west of the Mississippi and is truly a garden that is, uh, well, it's beautiful at all times of year, but it really shines in the late winter and early spring, which is right where we are uh, right now. So uh, please go take yourself out into nature. We all need it so much more um, than we ever have before. And um, we're just so close to spring that you'll see hope and promise and something beautiful, uh, guaranteed. And with that said, thanks so much for watching. Happy gardening.